Good morning, kids. So I was thinking about the Friday before spring break where I had a sub Miss Lanier and you had um, to read silently chapter 10 from our book novel and then do reading log eight, which was describe Veridonia, my second favorite character in the book. Um, and I figured you probably forgot that chapter. So by now, since you've been out of the classroom for two weeks now with this virtual school. So I'm going to read you chapter 10 and you are going to write your um, reading log, which is describe Feridonia and then support with details from the story. Now, you don't have to have helmets, you don't have to have quotes, evidence and things like that. But I do want you to, as I read, I want you to support it with the description of her. Um, this book is Heir Apparent by one of my favorite authors, Vidian Van De Valde. And this is chapter 10, Family History. I've been sabotaging myself. I blame Rasmussen, of course. In this day of fractured families, what made them think the average gamer would be willing to hang around just for a parental goodbye? The next time I went down the hill, I spoke politely to my foster mother and to Sir Deming. And then when my mother said, aren't you going to stay a little longer to say goodbye to your father? I drove thoughts of paternity suits and cheap birthday and Christmas gift certificates from my mind. Why, of course, how could I leave without saying goodbye to my father? I said, oh, for goodness sake, Deming snapped. We haven't the time. Sure we do, I told him. He continued to grumble and complain, but from what I've seen play in playing this game so far, there was absolutely nothing I could do or say to make the man act pleasantly. My father didn't take long to arrive. He came running over the hill that my computer subconscious identified as the direction of the bog. Janine, he cried, sweeping me into a great bear hug that took me totally by surprise. He was such a big guy, I found my face pressed into his chest. Considering that he had come straight from cutting the peat in the bog, this was not the best position in the world to be. I held my breath, trusting that he would let go before I actually suffocated. I could hear my little foster siblings chanting for his attention, Father, Father! Hush now, my mother said. Run along. Your father, your sister, and I must speak to this man. Then, still pressed against my father's chest, I could both hear and feel the rumble of his voice. My father asked, She's been told then. Yes, Stemming sighed impatiently. My father held out an ar at arm's length to look me over, and I was amazed to see that his eyes glistened with tears. I was hoping we'd have more time, he said. Was he going to miss me? My father was saying he was going to miss me? Though he was just a stupid computer sim simulation, I felt my own throat tighten. I'll come back, I promised, or better yet, I'll send for you. He forced a smile. We'll come, he assured me. Then he glanced in Sir Deming's direction before he said to me, Janine. He hesitated, and Deming said, Get on with it, man. Shake her hand. Wish her luck. Repeat after me. It's been nice knowing you. Goodbye. I sincerely hoped that at some point during the progr progress of this game, I would be called upon to kill Deming. Surely one of the infinite variations Mr. Rasmussen had talked about could accommodate that. Could we have some privacy here? I asked. Yet again, Deming sighed, but he strode several long steps away. Janine, my father said. When you first came to us, you were less than a week old, just a tiny little bundle wrapped in a blanket. My mother nodded mutely, mutely dabbing her eyes. I glanced at my father's rough and dirty hands and saw no ring, 
but why would a peat cutter have a ring? He continued, The midwife who brought you said that you were the daughter of a king and of a servant woman who had died in birth. From off to the side, Deming complained, She's been told all this. Go away further, I ordered him. He took a few more steps and I wiggled my fingers to, for, at him to keep going until he was practically at the neighbor's pig pen. In a lowered voice, father continued, When your birth mother died and she didn't have any relatives for, to send to you, your uncle mayor, who was the ki king's gardener, suggested to the king that we might take you in. The king knew that at court of your life would be in danger because the queen was obviously not pleased by the idea of your competing with her own children. And the king favored you, my mother said, because he loved your mother so, and because the queen brought up her sons to love only her and not him. Well, that explains some things. Father glanced at Deming, who was facing the other direction and was a good 30 yards away. Still, Father lowered his voice to a whisper. So the midwife brought you here. But she also brought something else. Yes, I prompted. He nodded. A ring. Really, I said. Imagine that. It's a magic ring, Mother told me. Now that was interesting. I had been assuming it was just a keepsake to prove that I was the king's choice. What kind of magic does it do? I asked. Father said, the midwife didn't say. She just said it was something your mother had asked her, asked with her dying breath to be given to you if you were ever summoned to the court. When that seemed to be the end of the story, I said, which... I just have been, which you just have been, he agreed. So where's the ring? The midwife has it. I decided it would be safer with her, just in case the queen knew of its existence and tried to get it from us. I didn't even tell Salida here. Okay, that made sense, sort of. Where's the midwife? She has become a hermit, father said, in service of the, at the shrine of St. Bruce, the warrior poet. I had heard of it, but no memory stronger than mine, than the name recognized, recognized, sorry. I had heard it, but no memory stronger than name recognition surfaced. So I need to go to the shrine, I said. If you want the ring, father agreed. After, well, what felt like a dozen full starts because I didn't have it. Be safe, he told me. Be good, my mother told me. I kissed them both. I kissed my brothers and sisters. And this time, I really felt as though I was leaving my true family behind. I was tempted to go back up the hill and kiss Dusty. But I was sure Deming would ride off without me if I tried. Are we finally quite through? Deming asked. Father stepped into within nose length of him and said, She's your new king, little man. Treat her respectfully. For some reason, maybe because my father was about a foot taller and maybe two feet wider, Deming bobbed his head and stammered, Yes, of course. I mean, does it please you to go now, your highness? My father winked at me as Deming lifted me onto the horse before he mounted in front of me. The first time he hadn't left me to scramble on by myself. Goodbye. Goodbye. My family and I called out. I kept looking back and blowing kisses until I could no longer see them. Maybe the people at Rasmussen needed to develop a new game, game called something like Happy Family, where there's no gathering treasures or fighting hostile warriors or solving puzzles. Just nice people who speak kindly to you and don't make you feel like one of those Christmas trees you see by the curb on December 26. Oh, we got a friend. 
I bet other people besides me would be interested. Spooky. Yeah. Spooky. <laughs> Okay, I bet other people besides me would be interested. Maybe. Okay, probably not. When we got to the crossroads beyond the boundary to St. Jean, I told Deming, we need to go to the shrine of St. Bruce the warrior poet. Why? He demanded, his newfound respect strained. Because I'm your new king and I command it. I told him. Deming sighed, but turned down a different road from the one we had taken in all the previous games. I don't even like poetry, he complained. It was the first thing he said that I could relate to. The road led into the woods where Deming chose a path that was more or less following a stream. He insisted that though not a lover of poetry, he knew the way. I wondered if we were going to meet the bow happy relatives of the poacher boy which got me to wondering what would happen to him since I wasn't going straight to the castle. But if I was supposed to play a part in that, his capture by the guards must be triggered by my arrival at the castle. It wasn't a long ride before we reached what looked like about to fall down lean to of twigs and hide that sagged against the hill. Spooky, you can't be up here right now. She doesn't want to leave me. There she is, Deming said, stopping the horse. <laughs> okay. <Come. laughs> Ow. Oh, she's a persistent kitty cat. There she is, Deming said, stopping the horse half a city block length away. Ferdonia the knitter. I'm not going any closer. Ferdonia the knitter. I squinted my eyes in the direction he was looking at what I suppose was a heap of forest debris piled by the wind into a corner formed by the lean-to in the hill. I became aware that the pile of debris had looked up and was watching us. Wait for me, I told Deming, dismounting. Yeah, yeah, he said. He too got off the horse and led it to the stream to drink. I approached the lean-to. Good day to you, I said. The reason the person, Ferdonia, looked like a compost heap, excuse me, oh gosh, compost heap was that her clothes seemed to be made of entirely of vegetation. She had a basket by her feet that was filled with dandelions and that was what she was knitting with. I mean, she had knitting needles made of smooth sticks, but she was using dandelion stems as the yarn. Dandelion stems not being very long, every few stitches she would reach down into the basket for a new dandelion. Oh, you gotta see this. She's kissing the book. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Okay. Oh, this cat is funny. Okay, let me turn and you can lay on my lap. Where was I? I mean, she had knitting needles made of smooth sticks, but she was using dandelion stems as yarn. Dandelion stems not being very long, every few stitches she would reach down into the basket for a new dandelion, lop off the top, top with her thumb, and then add this new stem to the garment she was knitting. And I knew it was a garment she was making because she seemed to be wearing last season's model over a fashionable chemise of what I guess to be moss and lichen, with accents, points of leaves, and a hint of feather. She had a two-foot-wide mushroom cap on her head. Now, that's a pretty good description, okay? So I'm going to reread that, just those two sentences, and you paraphrase that in your reading log. I knew it was last season's garment because she was she was making because she seemed to wear wear last season's model over a fashionable chemise of what I guessed to be moss and lichen with an accent points of leaves and a hint of feather. She had a two foot wide mushroom cap on her head. Hold on, she told me. I'm counting knits and pearls. 
I waited until she got to the end of the row. So she didn't set her project down, but she looked up at me through her bushy eyebrows, which themselves almost looked knitted. Who are you and why are you here? I'm Janine, I told her. She looked at me blankly. Janine de St. Jean? Still, no reaction. You were midwife at my birth in the king's castle, where my mother died? You brought me to my foster parents, Salida and Dexter, the pea cutter. She was the right woman, wasn't she? You don't look like the Janine I remember, she said. Well, I was beginning to get worried. It has been 14 years, hmm, she said noncommittally. My parents, well, my foster parents said that they left a ring with you that my mother wanted me to have. We'll see, Faridonia said. She carefully set her knitting down in the basket and stood, creaking and snapping. I couldn't tell if it was her bones or something she was wearing. She was even shorter than me, probably only four feet tall. Well, come on then. She motioned me to follow her into the lean-to, which hardly looked big enough for two, but it turned out only to be an entryway, protecting a huge crack in the side of the hill. There were burning torches set into the nooks and crannies in the cave's surface, so I had no trouble seeing. The cave must have been formed by an offshoot of the stream we'd been following, for it was quite damp. almost done with this chapter, which made me sneeze. The cave was roundish and is about as big, say, as your average one stall in sink ba public bathroom, which is also kind of smelled like. At the far wall was a life-size statue of a man who most likely was St. Bruce, the warrior poet. What was kind of neat was that even though his face was carved wood, his armor was real. A plate metal helmet, the visor was up, which is how I saw his face. Gauntlets, shin protectors, and a surcoat of mail. Thousands and thousands of interlocking circles of metal. Wow, I said, impressive. When Faridonia didn't say anything, I asked, Um, what do I have to do with me? What does this have to do with me and the ring? She waggled her finger at the statue and my heart sank. I hid the ring in the coat of mail. She smiled apologetically, showing little brown teeth and I winced. Not for the teeth, because, but because I saw what was coming. I wish I could remember where. Hmm. I ran my fingers over the metal, but nothing came loose. Any hints, I asked. Arms, shoulders, back? She shook her head. But the rightful owner, and according to you, that you can call it forth. How? Why, by reciting poetry, of course. Of course, I asked. You mean like, I paused to remember... Listen, my children, you sh and you shall hear of a midnight ride of Paul Revere. Cute, though a bit short, she said. No, that wasn't the whole thing. I started panicking because I didn't know the whole thing. I just said all that I remembered. Did I know any poem in its entirety? No matter, for she said, but it has to be a poem of your own making. Oh, I said, how hard could that be? Of course, Faridonia said. If St. Bruce doesn't like your poem, he chops off your head. And that is chapter 10. So, write your reading log, a detailed description of Faridonia, and place it in the Word document I included in this lesson. Stay healthy.